Um, can you hear me? I've got an accent that speaks fast, so stop me. Um, but it being the week of Passover, Easter, you know, the biggest idea on the table right now really is the question of freedom. And, uh, you know, in Hebrew it's called cherut, in Chinese it's ziyo. And, you know, I was you know, thinking about it for today, you know, in Chinese, if you know Chinese, and many more students at Wesley know Chinese, there's always a connotation of selfishness to freedom. You know, apart from the Communist Party's reservations about it, apart from the Confucian traditions, the allergy to it, there is in the very language of the Chinese expression today, ziyo sounds zi, zi, selfish. In Hebrew, freedom is related to the word of inscription, being inscribed with a profound question, not an answer, but a question about what's the difference between freedom from oppression, we talked about southern India, and satyagraha, so when you want to break out of the trammels of things that hold you back, versus the freedom for self-becoming. And I guess what I want to put on the agenda for all of us tonight is how do we move from freedom from to freedom towards an expansion of the self, as Jeff Ryder said, that's not about where I am right now, but where it may be where I'm trying to go to, which I cannot even conceive of, which might not be relevant to my position. So 1999, May, I spoke in the chapel for convocation. And it was a, an interesting moment for me because I'd just been in China, as I always am very frequently in May. And on May 9th in Beijing, I heard about the bombing of the, Ameri of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. Um, now, since then, we found out, which was a great mistake, America apologized for it. It turns out that the Chinese actually had military installations, and America was right to bomb it, but we tried to save Chinese face. In any case, I was in Beijing. There were incredibly intense anti-American demonstrations. It was not the first time I've been in the middle of demonstrations and tanks in China, far too often, for my family's taste. Uh, but it's the first time I was at Peking University, which I always am, and I was in a mob of about 200 anti-American demonstrators. And for the first time, and I think only time, I was afraid. I, and of course, as soon as I started to speak Chinese, everything was fine. You know, I was not part of the imperialist CIA um, scheme. And I said to myself, oh my god, I've been teaching Chinese, teaching Chinese for years, and I didn't get it right. I should have talked about, more about the Boxer Rebellion and the role of anti-foreignism. So it really made me rethink my teaching agenda. I came back from China. This was a couple of days before I spoke in the chapel. And somebody in West Hartford said, so what do you think about pornography at Wesleyan? And I said, what? I just came back you know, with this important world event. And it was the same time that the New York Times broke the story of the pornography course at Wesleyan. And the final project was a pornography film. And I said, oh my god. You know, like there's this big world, and then there's the world of the naval and the gonads. And like, how do we bring it together? <laughs> and uh, so I spoke at a much larger gathering in the chapel here, and I, I tried to speak about the importance of expanding the self beyond the naval, beyond the gonads, to something that takes us somewhere bigger and then returns us to ourselves. And you know, many of my students know I'm addicted to the last line of T.S. Eliot's quartets and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started for the first time and to know the place for the first time. So the journeys that we heard about, why we go far in order to return with fresh eyes. So I just want to um, share very few moments uh, from my own 36 year China journey. The Israelites were in the desert for 40, I've been going to China for 36, I'm not sure when I go back again or if I go back again. But when I look back to three and a half decades of China travel and China study, what sticks out to me is how much my China studies dislodged me from the comfort zone, for where I thought I started, for what I thought I knew. And I listened to you know, notions of remembered spaces and old stories. And really, you know, I think, in a way, China performed that function for me. So before I ever went to China, I had read the famous story by Lu Xun, China's foremost 20th century writer. Can you hear me? I'm speaking too fast. Yeah. Accent, I know. Uh, can you hear me? OK. Uh, you know, uh, this great Chinese writer talked about the importance. His first vernacular story in modern Chinese was called The Diary of a Madman. And it's about reading between the lines and the great Chinese culture that he woke up to in 1918 was that all of this 
chant about morality and tradition really added up the two words, children eat people. And it was the first time that all of Chinese tradition was equated to cannibalism. It was a very harsh, totalistic indictment for, of Chinese tradition. So I you know, went to China very ready to read between the lines. I'd been to Taiwan. I read Lu Xun you know, secretly. So I was really cool, and I was really you know, anti-war movement, very, very um, activist. And my 36 years of travel to China have been a constant undressing of my preconceptions and the need to really listen, to really read between the lines, not the way I did in 1970, early 70s in Taiwan, when I thought you know, that I knew Sartre and Gramsci, and therefore I understood China. But when I left theory behind and started to listen, and oddly, what I began to hear was my parents' story. I'm the daughter of Holocaust survivors, and people asked me, why do I study China? And it was a very simple answer. I ran from the familiar. Leave me alone with your stories. I'm going to, as far as I can, China is really cool. And the first book was called Long Road Home, and the books have uh, continued to circle that familiar ground. But I just want to share um, maybe three moments from this uh, China journey, and really the people that helped me, forced me, enabled me to both to listen to the unsayable in China, of which there's tons, but to really become more generously attuned to the history of Jews that I have been avoiding and are listening and reading to see the overlapping echoes. Uh, February 24th, 1979, I've been to China before. I went to China in 1977 for the first time, but I went to live in China in 1979 in the very first group of American exchange scholars. And it was, of course, very funny. There were six of us going to China, and there were about 50 Chinese advanced graduate students sent to Princeton and Stanford for advanced scientific studies. Uh, there are lots of things I could tell about that, but what's funny is that I was sent to China as an American. You can hear from my accent, I was barely, uh, you know, to this day, you know, I'm an, a naturalized citizen. So I said, well, I must be American if I'm going to China as one of the official American exchange scholars. And uh, we arrived shortly before the opening of the American embassy, and uh, on February 24th, there was a special reception held for us at the International Club. And for the first time, I met the president, a then president of Peking University, Be Beijing Daxue, Zhou Peiyuan, a physicist, a very distinguished scholar, who I knew had been beaten nearly to death during the Cultural Revolution. We didn't talk about physics. We didn't talk about the Cultural Revolution. Um, he asked me about my research. I talked about, I was interested in the May 4th movement of 1919, the first student movement for science and democracy, very touchy in 1979, as it is touchy all the way through today. And I just remember holding a glass of water, looking in Joe Yuan's eyes, and for the first time saying to myself, my God, I got it all wrong about the May 4th movement. Joe Peiyuan had been a participant, a very young participant. And so, you know, it was just the wrinkles around his eyes, the tiredness, the need to kind of proclaim the bright future of US-China relations and all the unsayable of the personal suffering that made me say, I've got to stay and listen far more deeply. There were no tunnels, but I was listening. Um, less than a month later, I was in the great hall of the people, you know, that huge, monstrous building, and it was International Women's Day. I was very familiar because I grew up in communist Romania, so I'm very familiar with March 8th. So there were thousands of women, and there we were, and I was, you know, the only American, you know, so-called scholar, so I was placed at the table of Wang Guangmei, the widow of China's premier who was murdered during the Cultural Revolution. And uh, I knew a little bit about who Wang Guangmei was, uh, not very much, I learned a lot more about her later. And she took a napkin and very expectedly wrote in Chinese, long live the friendship between Chinese and American women. That's, that's what you're supposed to say, you know, we were friends. Um, and then later, learning about how she had been, again, beaten. And she was made to dress up in all these clothes that she had worn as a diplomatic representative of China in Southeast Asia, and paraded as a whore on the campuses of the university, simply because she was educated and had tried to represent China abroad. So again, you know, we talk about, you know, the women hold up half the sky, the feminist revolution, and I still hold on to that fragile napkin because it teaches me how wrong I had been about things that I thought I understood about China. <laughs>
1989. Um, <clears throat> I'm in China, as I'm always in China. You know, my friends say, don't come. You come, there's a revolution. Please stay home. <laughs> 79, 89. You know. So I was in China in 1989 with my uh, son, who was barely five years old. Um, and of course, I caught the whole uh, Tiananmen event, left on the last plane on June 3rd. But on May 20th, 1989, I was invited to, long before. I'd been invited to a conference to mark the 80th anniversary birthday of a very eminent philosopher called Zhang Dainian at China's premier uh, MIT, Tsinghua University. May 20th ended up to be the first day of martial law after the crackdown, uh, the, the beginning of the crackdown in Tiananmen Square. So instead of hundreds and thousands of people that had been expected at this uh, very distinguished conference, there were 20 of us. The buses couldn't run. We rode our bicycles from Peking University to Tsinghua and uh, with this 80-year-old philosopher, and it was really grim, this big hall that now was cavernous, and people were speaking in very muted tones about the crackdown that everybody except the students in Tiananmen Square hoped wouldn't come, but we knew it was coming. And on the way back to the university, Zhang Danyan turned to me and said, you know, you are Jewish and I'm Chinese, and between us, zaman yu zhiyin, it's a very Chinese expression, which means between us there is the sound of unsayable, unmentionable music. You understand the music of my heart without words, because you people have suffered. You understand what is coming in China. This was May 20th, long before the tanks opened fire in the square. But the aged philosopher, who had already been persecuted many times, talked about this concept of Juryin, that we have this wordless understanding, precisely because history had positioned us for that meeting in which nothing could be said, and yet everything was left unsayable and yet understood. Um, Twelve years later, I'm chairman of history department Wesleyan. Oh, God help me. <laughs> that was the worst. And <laughs> that really was the worst. You know, I, I've been director of the Freeman Center, that's piece of cake, chair of history department is dreadful. Um, <laughs> and you know, I don't listen to radio, I don't watch TV, I'm listening to my books on tape, you know, I'm coming to school, I go upstairs and somebody says, all oh, the secretaries are crying. It's September 9th, 19, 2001. And I said, what, why are the secretaries crying? And uh, it was the, the uh, bombing uh, and the uh, events in, in, in uh, a terrorist attack on the United States. I remember, first of all, talking to the president of Wesleyan, go out into the public and meet the students. The president of Wesleyan then, it wasn't Michael Roth, stayed in meetings all day, never went out into public to meet with the students. The students were freaked out. I called up mental health. I said, we have to have some kind of public, you know, resources. Students have, you know, parents in New York. It was a, a really horrific, uh, I, to my mind, mishandling of Wesleyan's uh, reaction to historical trauma. But in the days and the week after, as chairman of history department, I had held many discussions with faculty and students. What can you say about 9-11? What could you possibly say about it? And I had no idea what could be said. I'd already spent all these decades with the unsayable in China. I had developed a lexicon, some poetic, some not so poetic, for words that have no room for word. But at that point, I really was um, horrified and what I decided is to put on my door the fragment of a poem by Primo Levi, which is where I want to end with tonight. Primo Levi was a chemist, an Italian chemist who was incarcerated in Auschwitz. And um, six years before he committed suicide in 1987, he wrote a poem called Voices. And you know, it's a poem that since 9-11 through today really speaks to me. And I guess if you know, there's a charge I want to leave you with, it's embedded in this poem by Primo Levi. Voices mute forever, or since yesterday, or just stilled. If you listen hard, you can still catch the echo, hoarse voices of those who can no longer speak, voices that speak and can no longer say anything, voices that speak and cannot be understood, salt word, words. The place we are going is silent. You will have to run the last lap deaf. And it made me think of the Chinese human rights activist, Cheng Wangchen, blind, running blind, 
escaping from his horrific incarceration and, and, and persecution in Shandong. So the Primo Levi's line, so you know, the crossing of the wires from survivor of Auschwitz to Chen Guangqian. You will have to run the last lap deaf. You will have to run the last lap by yourself. And I guess what I want to leave you with, you know, since I'm getting very close to retirement, which is pretty much what you've heard all night long, which is listen to the stories that are not about you. Be patient enough to rest with silence, with words that seem to say nothing, with words that seem circuitous, that dance around the subject. You know, I had a moment in my class discussion today that I was, you know, awesome, and yet, you know, I, you know, where Chinese students said a little bit too much, and I was so worried for her. What will be the consequences of putting it out there too explicitly? Because I still worry about the consequences. So I guess I leave you with, you will have to run the last lap by yourself. Thank you. Yeah.